Hi, I'm Antonia Kiel. I'm a master's student at the University of Hamburg at the Institute for Geophysics. And in my presentation, I'm going to talk about the question if we can monitor water content and temperature in the soil using seismic recordings. And we still have many open questions left, which are always going to be marked by this question mark symbol during the presentation, but I'm also going to summarize them in the end. So first I want to talk about our motivation. Our goal is to get information about the water content of the uppermost about one meter using seismic recordings. So in this plot I'm first going to show the temperature at the surface measured from January, January of 2018 until May of 2021. And what we can see right here is a seasonal trend. So in summertime we have much higher temperatures and during the winter months we have lower temperatures. Now I'm, go I'm adding the cumulative water content of the uppermost 120 centimeters to this plot. And for the water content we can see yet again that during that we have seasonal variations and during the summertime we have a decrease in water content and in the winter months, transitioning into spring, we see a slowly increasing water content. So I now add the relative seismic velocity changes, where I'm going to explain later how we got to them. Um, but we also see some kind of seasonal trend in our seismic velocity changes. So in the summertime, we see that our relative velocity change is kind of follow the temperature. For example, here in 2019, we see that our relative velocity change curve is kind of similar to the temperature curve. However, there are still some differences left. And during the winter month, we see, for example, also some very pronounced peaks right here and in the beginning of our time series. And we see, for example, in 2020 that our relative velocity change seemed to follow the cumulative water content, but vice versa. So we have a decreasing relative velocity change while increasing water content. So we now know that our seismic velocity seems to be influenced by both temperature as well as water content. Our goal is, however, that our relative velocity change should replicate the water content in our Soil. So basically, our goal is that the black line follows the blue line. And um, what even would be the advantage of using seismic recordings instead of using wells or soil sensors? So there are already very many seismometers all over the world installed, and they are rather easy to set up compared to digging a hole and installing so some soil sensors within the soil. So first of all, it would make an additional purpose to the already installed seismometers. And secondly, it might even be easier to install new seismometers compared to soil sensors. So I now want to talk about how we retrieved these relative velocity changes. So the black curve we had in the previous plot. And the technique we're using for this is called ambient seismic noise monitoring. And I'm going to talk now about the different parts of this technique. So first the seismic monitoring part, then ambient noise or ambient seismic noise, and then I'm going to combine them to this technique ambient seismic noise monitoring. So starting with our seismic monitoring part, what I show right here is what we measure at a seismogram. So basically we have a source which emits a wave field and then we record the displacement due to this wave field arriving at the station. And we can repeat this measurement if we have a repeater, repeating source. For example, if we assume we have a source which emits the same wave field every day, we measure the same dis ground displacement at our station again and again. However, if we now have a change in the subsurface or in the velocity within the subsurface, the waveform changes. So basically it just gets stretched in time. And in this case, we can see that the waveform seems to be kind of compressed. And looking closer at the same phase or a local minimum in this case arriving, we see that this local minimum arrives now earlier in time, which means that we had a velocity increase. So the same wave field traveled faster 
from the source, from the repeating source to the receiver. And of course, we can see the same thing if we have a velocity decrease. Now the same phase arrives later in time, which means that the wave field took longer to travel through the same path, and therefore we had a decrease in velocity. However, we not only want to say whether we had a velocity increase or decrease, but we really want to quantify the seismic velocity change. And this can be done using the stretching method. So what we first have to do is that we define a reference trace, which could be the black trace we had on the previous slide, so maybe just our first recording. And now in orange is shown a measurement after a velocity change took place, so similar to the blue waveform we saw on the previous slides. And what I also want to note here, what we can see very nicely and what we are also using during our study, but I'm not going to talk about that later again, is that we see the difference is much higher in the later arriving parts, so in the coda of the waveform, than in the earlier arriving parts. This is due to the fact that the later arriving wave field basically spent more time in the subsurface due to scattering and getting reflected several times. And therefore, we are more sensitive towards small velocity changes in the coda. And we also use the coda of our recordings in this study, but I'm not going to mention that again. So what we now do for the stretching method after we define our reference trace and we have our measurement after a velocity change happened, is that we stretch our measurement in time using different stretching factors, which is shown here by this equation. And this is visualized on the right-hand side. So what we have on the y-axis are the different stretching factors. So this epsilon value in percent, for example, from uh, minus 4% going up to plus 1%. And here we can see our pure measurement and reference trace again with the measurement being the orange curve and the reference trace being the black curve. And on the x-axis we have the lapse time or basically our recording time. What we now want to have or want to quantify is by which stretching factor our measurement got stretched compared to the reference trace. And we can do that by calculating the cross-correlation coefficient and looking for the highest correlation coefficient because the correlation coefficient indicates the similarity of the reference and stretched trace in our case. And this is shown right here. We have the correlation coefficient on the x-axis and on the y-axis, the different stretching factors, the same as on the left-hand side right here. And we see that we have the highest correlation coefficient for a value of around minus 1.5%. So this means for minus 1.5%, the reference trace and the stretched measurement are very similar, what you can also see here in the plot. And now using this stretching factor we just defined, we can pretty easily define the relative velocity change using this equation shown right here. And dv over v is then our relative velocity change, which we are calculating. So we now know how the seismic monitoring can work if we have a repeating source and measure the wave field again and again. So in the next part, I'm now going to talk about ambient noise. So what is shown right here is a seismogram from, let's call it classical seismology. So what we see here is an earthquake recording with all the different phases of the earthquake arriving here in the beginning. However, what we see is that much later, after all the earthquake waves arrived, we still have some displacement left. It is much lower in amplitude, of course, but we still have some noise left, or some displacement left, which is called noise, which does not result from the earthquake anymore. And now the question is, um, where does this originate from? And basically one can differentiate here between two classes of seismic noise sources for different frequencies. So for frequencies below one hertz, we have oceanic noise as a source or some weather effects. And for frequencies above one hertz, we have cultural noise, for example, machinery work or some traffic or human activity taking place at the surface. And what I al already want to mention here is that higher frequencies are more sensitive towards shallower layers in the soil. And since we are interested in very shallow layers with only one meter, 
um, we want to use rather high frequencies. So for sure, frequencies above one hertz in our study. So the next question is, what are possible noise sources at, at our study site? Here I'm introducing our study site. So our study site is located in Hamburg, which can be shown right here. It's in the east of Hamburg. And here we see in red our three seismic stations. And there are also soil sensors installed right here from the Institute of Soil Science of the University of Hamburg. And we also have some weather measurements right here. So we have information about the temperature and the water content in different depths due to these soil sensors. And what we want to talk about now are the possible noise sources. So first of all, we have the highway A A1 right here. So of course we have some vehicles uh, passing by and they create some seismic noise. Next up we have trains also close to our study site and they also produce some ambient seismic noise in, in frequencies above one hertz. And lastly we have also some gravel work activity happening very close to our study site so it is yet another noise source. So we have a lot of possible noise sources so the question is can we really detect them? on our seismic measurements. To show that I calculated a spectrogram of two weeks, in this case two weeks in March of 2020. And we see on the x-axis the time, so the weekdays shown right here. And on the y-axis we see the frequencies in a logarithmic scale and lighter colors indicate a higher noise power. And first, for frequencies below 1 hertz, we have our oceanic noise sources or weather effects. And we can very nicely see the secondary microseism here. This is the rather continuous line. Um, and this is due to oceanic noise sources. However, as I mentioned, we are more interested in frequencies above 1 hertz. So we have a look at this frequency range again. And here we can see some clearly daily and weekly patterns of high, high noise levels. So we see during the working hours during uh, at weekdays, we see high noise power in the frequencies above one hertz. And during the night times and also during the weekends, we see less noise sources. So as I mentioned before, higher frequencies are more sensitive towards shallow structures. So we want to use cultural noise for sure. And in our case, we uh, used the frequency range of 1 to 6 hertz because in this frequency range we can see that we also have some noise sources during the weekends and during the night time so we ha can have a continuous measurement. So now we know what seismic monitoring is and we know what ambient seismic noise is. However, we still need to get these repeating source receiver settings because so far we only have random noise sources, many noise sources. And we now want to have this source receiver setting, which we need. So the question is, how do we get source receiver signals from this pure noise? Um, what we do, to do, how we do that is that we have now two stations which record this ra rather random looking noise. And then we cross correlate the noise of the two station. And this basically extracts the coherent part of the wave field running through both stations and therefore we can then get our virtual seismogram. So what does this cross-correlation function or this virtual seismogram mean? Um, indicated here as the black dashed line is the zero time lag introduced due to the correlation coefficient calculation, uh, due to the cross-correlation calculation. And for the positive time lag, um, we now see how a seismogram would look like if station one was a virtual source and station one would be the receiver. So we basically have now a source receiver setting due to cross-correlating the noise of two stations. And similarly, we can also have a kind of seismogram for, uh, using the negative time lag. However, in this case, the source and station would be swapped. So in this case, station two would now be the source and station one would be the receiver. So the cross-correlation function of two stations recording the seismic noise gives virtual seismograms, which are basically source receiver settings. And this means that we can now apply the seismic monitoring technique to these cross-correlation functions. 
So as a summary of the necessary processing steps, first we have to calculate the cross-correlation of noise to get our virtual seismograms between those two stations. Then we have to repeat our measurements and this is just due to the time window over which we calculate the cross-correlation. And here we can define the time however, pretty much however desired. We can go from an hourly scale to a daily scale or even monthly scale, depending on our goal. So this is an advantage of the ambient seismic noise monitoring because it can be done at different time resolutions and we are therefore very flexible in time. And of course, then if we have a change in velocity, we see that our wave field or our waveform virtual seismogram, so cross-correlation function, got stretched. And this stretch we can then calculate using the stretching method already introduced. So now we know how we can determine this relative seismic velocity changes. And now we want to have a look at our results at our study site in the east of Hamburg. So I basically go, now go back to the plot I already introduced in the motivation. So we have four years of continuous measurements so far. And as a reminder, in red we have the temperature, in blue we have the cumulative water content of the uppermost 120 centimeters. And in black we see our relative velocity changes. And we can see what already also was shown in other studies that an increase in temperature means an increase in seismic velocity. This is for example visible here in 2019 where our water content is rather stable. And we see that our relative velocity change seemed to follow the temperature curve quite nicely. Next up, what was also shown in other studies is that during an increase of water content, we have a decrease in velocity. This can, for example, be shown here in 2020, where our temperature curve is, let's say, rather stable. It's not really stable, but more on the stable side. And here we can see that we have an increase in water content while we have a decrease in seismic velocity. And one more thing we can see is freezing events. So here are marked the time windows for which the surface temperature gets below zero degrees Celsius. And for these time windows, we have a very strong velocity increase. Here zoomed into the first ve velocity increase we had in 2018, so this freezing event. Um, and we see that as soon as the surface temperature is below zero degrees Celsius, a very strong velocity increase happens. This is caused by the fact that the frozen layer with the water on in the uppermost layer of the soil is very stiff. And therefore this solid layer has, as typical for solid media, a very high velocity. However, I do not want to focus on the influence of these freezing events in my study because I want to focus on the relation between temperature, water content and seismic velocity change without looking at these freezing events, which behave kind of differently. However, if one of you is interested in these freezing events, I recommend a paper by René Steinmann, who also worked on a similar data set or on the first round here of these measurements. And um, he published a paper really investigating these freezing events. However, in my further investigation, I excluded the time windows at which these freezing events happened. So we now know that temperature and water content both influence the seismic velocity. So we now have to understand the relation between these three parameters to get the seismic velocity to represent only the water content without including any temperature effects. So this is what we're going to talk about now, the relation between changes in seismic velocity, temperature and water content. And first of all, I briefly want to explain why temperature and water content even change the seismic velocity. And this might be helpful to get a better intuition of what really happens in the soil. So in general, seismic velocities are higher in more stiff materials, as I mentioned when talking about the freezing event. So if we now have an increase in temperature in the subsurface, this means that we have thermal dilatation. So this would basically mean that we have an expansion, which would result in a lower density, which 
would therefore cause a decrease in seismic velocity. However, this is not the case due to the fact that we are in confined soil and therefore the expansion does also result in a higher pressure in the soil, which is basically more important, let's say, and or has a higher impact on the seismic velocity. And therefore we have this higher pressure, which means that we have a higher density and therefore we have an increase in seismic velocity due to temperature changes. So for the water content, I do not want to go into detail too much on the different wave types, um, but the kind of seismic waves we are using, it is for the kind of seismic waves we are using in our study is important to note that we are we have high contributions of shear waves. And shear waves basically means that we that the direction of propagation is perpendicular to the direction of particle motion. And here it is important to note that shear waves do not exist in fluids. So if our, our pores are filled with water, we have a decrease in seismic velocity. So this is, uh, this is why temperature and water content influence the seismic velocity and what is thought of how exactly that takes place or as a rough idea. Um, and in the, in the next slides, I am going to repeat this kind of overview with temperature, water content and relative seismic velocity, but I'm just going to use the abbre abbreviation introduced right here because the picture will be much smaller on the next slides. So first we have a look at the temperature and water content, which influence each other, of course, for example, due to evaporation. So in this plot, I show on the x-axis now the temperature and on the y-axis the volumetric water content, which is, which is measured at different depths and the different depths are introduced by the different colors. However, this plot is rather chaotic with all the different depths in one plot. So here on the right-hand side, I extracted just the depth of five centimeters. And what we can see, maybe even better for higher, depth is that there seems to be a kind of linear relationship between the temperature and the volumetric water content and therefore I also calculated a linear regression for all the depths here shown only for the depth of five centimeters. Um, however what I want to mention here for the linear regression is R being the basically quality factor of the linear regression and the quality factor means or shows how good our data points fit to a linear regression. And if the absolute of the R value is close to one, it means that our points really nicely fit to a linear regression. And if it is close to zero or smaller, it means that our distribution of measurements does not really fit to a linear regression. So here we do not have a significantly good fit with zero point. 7.2 being the absolute of the R value. So here is the first question, if these relations are further investigated and if there are some relations known of between the temperature and the volumetric water content in the soil and preferably something else than a linear relationship because it seems that the linear re relationship is not the best fit to quantify the relation between temperature and volumetric water content. So I now briefly talked about the relation between temperature and water content. And next up, we're going to talk about the relation between temperature and seismic velocity. So basically I show now a similar plot. So on the x-axis we have the temperature and on the y-axis we now have the relative velocity change in percent. And in the different colors, we see the different depth at which the temperature is measured. So here shown again for the depth of only five centimeters because the left plot is very chaotic in this case. Um, and here I calculated yet again a linear regression because we need some kind of quant uh, quantification between uh, for the relationship between the temperature and relative velocity change. So here I now want to have a closer look at the linear regression, what this regression means. So the linear regression y is the slope times the temperature, 
temperatures, in our case on the x-axis, plus the intercept with the y-axis. And what our slope A basically is, is the relative velocity change per degree Celsius. So it quantifies the relation between the temperature and relative velocity change. And it is important to quantify this relation between these two parameters because we want to eliminate the temperature effects, which we can do if we really understand the relation between these two. Um, so therefore I calculated the linear regression right here. And having a look at the R value again, we see that our value or quality factor is at 0.51 which is by far not a good fit. So it means that our data points do not really fit to a linear regression. So this needs to be understood much more in detail with the physical background. But as a first approximation, we are now going to proceed using just this linear regression. So we see that we can fit a linear relation between the two parameters, temperature and seismic velocity, but the quality factor was by far not the best. So there's a lot of room for improvement, as I just mentioned, but we are going to con continue with this linear regression. So next, we are going to have a look at the relation between water content and seismic velocity. And here we are going to use the linear regression between temperature and seismic velocity I just calculated and how I'm going to explain now. So just as a reminder of our goal, we want the relative velocity change to replicate the water content. So the blue curve to be equal to the black curve. Um, and this would then mean that we could use seismic measurements to deduct the water content in the soil. And shown here in the plot, in black is the relative velocity change and in blue is the cumulative water content. However, it is important that the cumulative water content is now plotted from high values going to low values since there is an anti-correlation and it is just more appealing for the eye to find the correlation. So I just flipped the y-axis for the cumulative water content right here. And what we see right here is that the relative velocity change might indicate this some seasonal changes or it shows some seasonal changes. However, there are two problems. First of all, we of course still have the effects of the temperature which also show a seasonal variation. And next up, we are interested not only in seasonal variations, but we want to be on a much higher time resolution. So the, yeah. So really looking at, for example, daily variations of the water content using our seismic recordings. So we can't use our data as it is right now. And the main problem is that our velocity is a function of water content and temperature. And the solution would be that we, and our goal is to get a function of only the water content and eliminating the temperature effects. And the solution for this would be subtracting the velocity change, which is caused by a change in temperature. So that our residual relative velocity change is independent of the temperature. And this can be done by subtracting the linear regression that quantifies the seismic velocity change and change in temperature. And therefore we would get a residual relative velocity change, which now only depends on the water content. And therefore we now have a function of only the water content if we consider that our linear, linear regression would really quantify the relation between relative velocity change and temperature well. Um, and this is what I did now for our data. And I also did the same thing using the relation between the temperature and water content, because we also want the water content to be um, independent of the temperature change. And this is shown right here in this plot. Now we're plotting only the residuals without the temperature effects. And what we can see right here is that the short-term changes in the residual water content are represented quite well by the residual changes in velocity, for example, shown right here. But I'm now going to zoom into the plot a bit more. So we see that most of the small peaks align, especially in time, between the water content and relative velocity changes. For example, here in 2019, we see this 
uh, minimum where the cumulative water content increases is shown quite nicely also in the change of the seismic velocity also right here. So we see that in several cases it already seems to fit quite nicely to each other. However, the amplitudes differ a lot and there are some changes in water content, for example here, the strong decrease in water content, which does not show at all in our seismic velocity change. So this shows, uh, so concluding what was done was that we took a low quality linear regression between temperature and water content, as well as temperature and seismic velocity changes, and used this quantification to eliminate temperature effects. And this seems to work quite well considering the low quality of linear regression we had. But there is for sure a lot of room for improvement and hopefully these changes which do not uh, show up in the relative velocity change or in the residual relative velocity change at the moment would show up if we would have a better regression between the values. So again, the question is basically, um, are there some ideas on the physical relation between temperature and water content? Maybe some different ones than a linear one, and maybe also some intuition on how the relation between temperature and relative velocity changes could be explained, preferably something else than a linear regression, because a linear regression alone does not seem to um, give the best results yet. So we now talked about the relation between water content and seismic velocity while eliminating the temperature effects, but now I just want to say, take a step back without using this low quality regression and just having a look at our raw data basically of the water content and seismic velocity changes. So what I now want to have a look at is if the seismic velocity behaves differently during wetting and drying periods. And therefore I show right here the volumetric water content at a depth of five centimeters in percent over our investigation period. And shown in blue are the wetting periods and in red are shown the drying periods. And here in the winter of 2018, 2019, I plot the data in orange and in the, in the, on the next slide, I'm going to explain why I did that, but it would mean a wetting period normally. So this plot is again similar to what we saw before. In this case, we now have the volumetric water content on the x-axis and relative velocity change on the y-axis plotted in the different colors for the different depth. And here I show now the depth of only five centimeters, so it's not five centimeters, 80 centimeters, but only five centimeters, but differentiated between wetting and drying periods. And what we see is that there seem to be two kind of branches with the visible. So here for the drying periods and here for the wetting periods. However, here are several outliers. And if I now mark this one period, I just talked before, uh, talked about before, so winter 2018, 2019, in a different color, we can see that all these outliers result from this time period. So far, I have no idea why they seem to behave differently. But if we neglect them, we see a kind of hysteresis effect in our data, which means that the seismic velocity behaves differently depending on whether the water content increases or decreases. So it basically does not take the same path back. So here the question is if there are similar, similar hysteresis effects known of, maybe also in relation with, with temperature, because we still have the temperature effects included in our data because I did not use the low quality elimination of temperature effect in this case. But I tested it using our low quality linear regression and eliminating the temperature effects of our data. And in this case, I now do not see the hysteresis effect anymore. So the question is if the hysteresis effect disappeared due to our low quality illumination, or if this, the hysteresis effect was caused due to temperature effects and therefore does not show up in our data anymore. So it would be interesting to repeat this plot when we have a better understanding of how to eliminate the temperatures from
the seismic velocities and the water content. So we now talked about the very complex relation between temperature, water content and seismic velocity, which all influence each other. And as a first test, we saw that the elimination of the temperature using linear regression worked astonishing well, considering that we had such a low quality of linear regression. But there is still a long way to go to really get the residual seismic velocity changes to represent the water content in the soil. So using seismic recordings to measure the water content directly. So since we talked about the water content a lot, the question is of course also, what is about rainfall events? So as we've seen, an increase in water content means a decrease in seismic velocity. So a velocity drop would be expected after rainfall events. And now I want to have a look at some rainfall events. So first we're going to have a look at a rather strong rainfall event from July of 2018, shown right here. So the upper plot shows the cumulative water content and precipitation in millimeters per, de per day of the four years. And in the middle we see now zoomed in this very strong velocity increase, uh, this very strong rainfall event in July of 2018. And now we have again the cumulative water content and the precipitation, but in this case the precipitation is in millimeters per hour. And uh, in the lower plot is shown the relative velocity change on with a time resolution of two hours. And now we see that after our very strong rainfall event right here, we have a drop of in velocity of around 1%. So this would basically confirm our hypothesis that we have a velocity drop after a rainfall event. And what I want to mention now is that we have a cumulative water content of around 340 millimeters in this case, because this will be important for the next rainfall event we are going to look at. So basically we now see the same plots, but um, our rainfall event is now in April of 2019, which is shown right here. And in this case, we see that we do not have a drop in velocity after the rainfall event. So the question is, why don't we see a drop in velocity? So first of all, we previously had a rainfall event of around 12 millimeters per hour. And in this case, we only have a rainfall event of around three millimeters per hour. So the question is if the rainfall event is just too small in amplitude with only around one fourth in amplitude of the previous rainfall event. Or another explanation could be that the water content is already too high because now we have a cumulative water content of around 425 millimeters, so around 100 millimeters more. So maybe the pores are basically already filled with too much water so that the rainfall event does not affect the seismic velocity anymore in this case. So these are also some open questions where we have to work on and where we um, need some ideas of, of how this exactly works. Maybe it's a combination of both theories, but we need to work on this question. So as a summary, I now want to go back to the question, can we monitor temperature and water content changes due to changes in seismic velocity. So first we saw that seismic velocity depends on both temperature and water content, which, and for this we saw that an increase in temperature means an increase in seismic velocity, and an increase in water content means a decrease in seismic velocity. And secondly, we saw that eliminating temperature effects by our low quality linear regression shows already a very good or a good uh, correlation between the residual water content and seismic velocity change, much better than our basically raw data, including the temperature effects. So it can be expected that with better understanding of the re relation between temperature, water content, and seismic velocity change, our seismic velocity change could be used to um, have a look at the water content in the soil. And third, we saw that we can sometimes see a drop 
in velocity after a rainfall event, but here we can't see it after every rainfall event. So the question is, when can we see a drop in velocity? When can't we see a drop in velocity? What causes this difference? And maybe then we could also use seismic recordings to uh, basically measure rainfall events, maybe in areas where we do have seismic stations, but less information about the rainfall. So all in all, there is for sure potential to monitor water content, but we need a bet much better understanding of the relation between the three parameters we talked about um, to use ambient seismic noise monitoring as a source or indicator of the water content in the soil. So lastly, I'm now going to summarize the open questions I had during the talk. First of all, how are temperature and water content related to each other, having a better understanding or more physical background um, than this linear regression. Next up, is there a better approach in eliminating the temperature effects than this simple linear regression used so far? So for this, we again need, need to dig more into the physical relations between these three parameters. Next up, I had the hysteresis effect, which showed up in the relation between relative velocity change and water content. And here's the question if similar effects are known of, is it maybe due to temperature? Would we still see it if we had a better way of eliminating the temperature effects in our data? And of course, what's the reason that we can't see a velocity drop after every rainfall event we recorded? And lastly, maybe are there also some different factors than water content and temperature, which we might not have considered so far, which take place in the same dimension, so in the uppermost about one meter of the subsurface, on the time scale we are looking at, and maybe we have to include them in our study as well. Thank you for listening.